Good afternoon. My name is Beatriz Rangel. I am a board member of the Inter-American Institute for Democracy. And my role is to take care of international relations. It is my distinct pleasure to give the most cordial welcome to our, to, to our keynote speaker today, Dr. Valentin Prodajevich, which was the former president of the Economic Court of Odessa, and who is going to uh, discuss um, whether Ukraine, the current crisis, crisis in Ukraine, it's the door for the beginning of a new era of, so, of Russian imperialism, and what are the implications of this development for Latin America. The Inter-American Institute for Democracy is a non-for-profit with uh, the objective to promote and, and disseminate the values of freedom, democracy, human rights, and institutional building in Latin America. It is, it's made up of uh, scholars, politicians, professionals, um, um, uh, business people, men and women of different nationalities. It is a, a think tank that has no partisan biases, and it's um, uh, and it, it achieves its objectives of strengthening the values of freedom and democracy through the organization of events like congresses, fora, um, colloquiums, and also con by conducting research on topics that either reinforce democracy or threaten democracy in the Americas. It has an editorial fund that has uh, over 60 um, books published on themes and subjects that, um, that um, deal with the institutional strengthening of democracy in Latin America. We greet you from our headquarters, our chairman, Tomás Regalado, el ver, the, our very distinguished sp sp spokesperson, Valentín Rodallet, Professor Luis Fleischmann, who's a member of our board of directors, and Dr. Ricardo Israel, who's also a member of our board of directors. The colloquiums at the Inter-American Institute for Democracy have a format by which there we have a main speaker that has 20 minutes to develop a subject, and then two or more um, commentators are, can either pose questions or comment on the presentation, and each will have three minutes to do so. Um, our colloquiums do not, do not aim at concluding, uh, 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 at concluding on one recommendation or another. It's just an opportunity to discuss in depth a sub subjects that are affecting democracy and freedom in the world. Today, we are here gathered to discuss the crisis that is undergoing Ukraine, um, which is the victim of uh, the expansionist aim of Russia. Uh, Russia, which is now uh, led by Mr. Vladimir Putin. According to Mr. Putin, Ukraine, it's the platform that the West uses to threaten Russia's independence. On, on the other hand, Ukraine fears, and the West fears, that what Mr. Putin is really aiming at is to uh, blur all the frontiers between East and West and make advances on the West. U Ukraine, to my mind, has the very bad luck of being located in the uh, in the very, very far end of Europe, where they almost meet the Asian continent, and where the eternal struggle between East and West has taken place. So it's therefore, Ukraine has been the prey of many invasions. Uh, this, this is starting in the 13th century with the Mongols, and then uh, the Mongols not only took over Ukraine, but they destroyed everything that was known as civilization in that, in that land. Um, 
Other invaders, invaders included uh, the Commonwealth of po po the, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, the, uh, the Austrian Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Tsarist Empire of Russia, and finally the Soviet Union. It's only from 1991 when Ukraine uh, really becomes an independent and free country. That independence and that freedom that was obtained through the very strong um, the strong will and determination of the uh, Ukrainian people is, is today threatened because there is a relaunching of the Russian imperialism that most likely will not stop at the, um, at the borders of Ukraine in order because what it is seeking is to have its status as a world power codified by the West and, and, and the, the East and the West. In order to understand this process better and determine what are the implications for Latin America, we have invited Dr. Valentin Prodavich. Um, so I would like very much to start this colloquium by asking our president, Tomás Regalado, that uh, delivers his welcoming remarks. Tomás Regalado is a very admired journalist of South Florida who also was twice uh, um, mayor of, of Miami and today has a very um, a program with very high ratings in Mega TV. Welcome, Dr. Regalado. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. And, uh, Good afternoon for those uh, in this hemisphere. Uh, good evening for those uh, watching in Europe and other uh, areas of the world. Because this is about the world. This is about survival. This is about uh, the need to be informed. And frankly, we are hungry here uh, for uh, information, uh, correct information. Uh, we seem to have um, everyone now is predicting what Putin is uh, going to do. Uh, however, we want to hear from an expert, a person that is a protagonist and that it feels uh, very much to him because that's his uh, country. I, I, I think that this is important and I think that the Institute has done the right thing and, and we thank uh, Willy Cueto uh, for helping uh, Beatrices in organizing uh, this uh, event because uh, the President of the United States just said uh, yesterday uh, that to defend democracy it takes sacrifice uh, from the American people and that uh, we will see the pain uh, at the gas pump uh, because of uh, the crisis. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, this crisis uh, will be dealt with by uh, the world. But hopefully, uh, the President of the United States uh, will understand that to fight for democracy, we also need to be in this hemisphere with the countries uh, that are now uh, hoping uh, for a helping hand to bring back uh, liberty. So welcome and uh, a great welcome to uh, our viewers uh, and our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomas. Now um, we are going to invite to take the floor Dr. Valentin Pordavey. Valentin Pordavey that a which is if it's a, a public figure in Ukraine he's a politician a lawyer and a journalist he was the president of the economic court of the of Odessa from the 15th of July of he was from the 15th of July of 2002 until October 2011 he is the founder of the patriotic a website uh, from Ukraine called Ukridea. Mr. 
Dr. Podayev, please come to the podium. Would you like me to stay here? Я приветствую всех слушателей и хочу выразить благодарность институту за приглашение выступить здесь. Good afternoon to everyone who listens, and um, my, I speak with gratitude to this organization who invited me to speak. Происходящее сегодня событие – это не локальный конфликт между Россией и Украиной, а это вызов, который бросила Россия и Путин всему демократическому миру и миропорядку. What's happening today is not a local conflict between Russia and Ukraine. What's happening today is a conflict between Russia and the entire world, and the call to order of such. Естественное право человека – это право на мир, которое ему даровано Всевышним и нашим миром, нашей природой. The natural right of a human being is the right to freedom that's given in the right to happiness that's given to him by God and given to him by nature of birth. Это право закреплено во многих конституциях, но сейчас мир подошел к тому, что это право должно быть не просто правозаглашено, а должны существовать механизмы защиты этого права. This right is described in many constitutions. However, this right is not guaranteed. We need to come up with the mechanisms that will be um, controlling and enforcing this right for each of us. И то, что мы сейчас обсуждаем, то, что должно за этим последовать, это uh, действия, направленные на выработку механизмов защиты мира, когда он оказывается в таких ситуациях. And what we're discussing here today, and what we need to come up with, is that mechanism that reinforces this human right and protect each of us from what's going on today with Ukraine. Особенная задача Соединенных Штатов, народа Соединенных Штатов, политиков, конгрессменов, это способствовать выработке таких механизмов, по всей видимости, на базе Организации Объединенных Наций. The goal of the United States is government and people. It's to develop that mechanism on the base of the United Nations that will enforce international law of human rights and freedoms. Мир не должен полагаться на мнение отдельных глав государств и политиков, как им действовать в такой ситуации, а должен быть выработан алгоритм, при котором мир реагирует на попытки, в данном случае России, привести мир к самоуничтожению. Help the world maintain order, and it will help. May, it will help prevent the situation that uh, Ukraine ended up with uh, conflict with Russia, uh, namely Vladimir Putin. Это я дал мотивацию, которая есть у меня. Я думаю, что она будет услуш услушателей, когда они воспримут ту информацию, которую мы сейчас обсуждаем. This is my motivation, and I hope listeners will understand me and uh, will be on the same page. Um, with my train of thoughts and what I'm about to discuss with you. Теперь я бы хотел немного дать информацию по поводу Украины, России, конфликта, потому что американские граждане, безусловно, не имеют столь широкой информации вообще о истории взаимоотношений и о том, что на самом деле происходит между Украиной и Россией. I'd like to give a little bit of background information regarding relationship between Russia and Ukraine. Um, since American citizens don't have enough uh, of such information to make their own opinion. 
Но начать бы я хотел с личности Путина, с его психотипа, психопортрета. Потому что это очень важно. I'd like to begin with um, describing of a psychological type of Vladimir Putin. It's really important. Когда президент Клинтон заканчивал э, свою работу, он обнародовал материалы э, Центрального разведывательного управления э, по Гитлеру. Это так называемые документы Гитлера. Они были секретны, но не обнародованы. И я хочу к ним ну, обратить внимание. When President Clinton was finishing up his presidential term, he made a certain documents public that uh, relates to World War II, um, namely um, regarding Adolf Hitler. And uh, these papers are really important and related to my story. Согласно этих документов, Гитлер был психопатом, у которого была мания, он считал себя мессией, он сравнивался с Христом, и он считал, что он единственный человек, который может спасти Германию. According to these documents, Hitler was psychopath. He compared himself to Christ that uh, was born to save the world. И когда меня спрашивали, нападет ли Россия на Украину, я просил перефразировать вопрос, нападет ли Путин на Украину. So, before when I was asked, would Russia attack and invade Ukraine, I was always asking to rephrase the question and ask if Putin will attack and invade Ukraine. Потому что Путин обладает всеми характеристиками психопата и маньяка. Он готов достигать своих целей любыми путями. Его не остановит ни человеческие жертвы, ни принесение в жертву всего мира. Because it is um, ambitions of Putin and his psychotype that will be driven to achieve his goals at any cost, uh, disregarding all the possible and impossible sacrifices in his motherland and all over the world. И для того, чтобы понимать его действия и правильно на них реагировать, нужно понимать, кто он. In order to understand him and react properly, we need to understand who he is. В одной из своих статей в 2014 году, которая называлась «Киевский патриарх и зачем Путину нужна Украина», я об этом писал еще там, 7 лет назад, 8 лет назад. In 2014, I published an article um, that uh, called uh, Kyiv Patriarch, where I posed the question, who is Putin and what his motivations are. Уже тогда было видно, что Путин себя так же, как Гитлер, считает миссией, и он возложил на себя обязанность создать воссоздать Российскую империю, которая будет стоять во главе мира. It was obvious then in 2014 that Putin considered himself Messiah who needs to resurrect a former Russian Empire and dominate the world. То, что делает он сегодня, он пытается воссоздать мир двухполярный, но за этим последуют его попытки создать однополярный мир во главе с Россией. What he's trying to do right now is to create a bipolar world. But what will follow is his attempt to create a world of one power dominance. Мир стал двухполярным после попытки Гитлера такой мир создать и развязать вторую войну. Но в результате этого двухполярного мира стало два полюса – США и СССР. After World War II, an attempt of Hitler to create a bipolar world there were slightly changes. He did, his dreams didn't come true, but what happened, we had two major systems, uh, United States of America and Soviet Union. Эта ситуация существовала до распада СССР, и после этого мир имеет один полюс, это Соединенные Штаты. The situation existed until USSR fell apart, and from then on, up until now, the world have one superpower, which is United States of America. То, что сегодня делает Путин, это не попытка просто завоевать Украину, это попытка создать двухполярный мир. What Putin does today is not an attempt to 
um, conquer Ukraine. It's an attempt to develop new world order. If the Soviet Union has achieved such a position thanks to the war, Putin understands that у него нет достаточно сил, чтобы получить это дипломатическим путем, финансовым или экономическим, ему тоже нужна война. Soviet Union became super power because of war, Second World, World War. And today Putin understands that no economic, political and diplomatic moves will give him such power, nothing except war. И он с маниакальной последовательностью будет этого добиваться и его пока ничто не останавливает. Nothing will stop him at achieving his goal. Um, he will proceed just like maniacs do. В документах СРУ по поводу Гитлера рассказано, что когда его спросили, почему он идет в банк, он сказал, я всегда иду в банк. According to CIA documents um, that were released about Hitler, Hitler was asked once, why is he um, attacking other countries? Why is he um, acting like this? It's very dangerous to what he answers. I always go over bank, I always go against the current. Today Putin is not faking. He is going over bank, he is going straight against the current. Сегодня он ставит существование э, Украины, завтра он готов будет поставить опять в банк, но уже может пойти на, э, на существование мира. Today Ukraine is in danger and its existence is questionable according to him. Today is Ukraine, tomorrow is the same going to be for other uh, parts of the world. Э, чем это грозит? Чем угрожает сегодняшняя ситуация? So what's the actual danger of today's situation? Если ему позволят Путину делать сегодня то, что он делает, и он попытается создать двухполярный мир, то это отразится на жизни деятельности всех государств и цивилизации в основном тоже. If we will allow Putin to do what he does right now and let it be. He will create bipolar world and it will affect every country and every citizen of every country and all the ways of we're living today are not going to be the same. Most importantly, it will affect the United States of America. Because this war is not between Ukraine and Russia. It's a war between Russia and США. И у меня в четырнадцатом году была статья, которая называлась «Битва титанов». И я описывал во времени, что это наступит скоро. It is not a war between Russia and Ukraine. It's a war between Russia and the United States of America. In 2013, I wrote an article called Battle of Titans. And in my article, I described that this particular event will happen soon. And so it came to a happening. Многие страны, которые настроены не желательно к Соединенным Штатам, это Китай, это Иран, это страны и Южной Америки, они, безусловно, могут присоединиться к второму полюсу, полюсу России. The country that don't have friendly relationship with the United States, such as China, Iran, and certain other countries from Latin America, will join Putin in his efforts to create bipolar world. Мы, я думаю, об этом побеседуем. Я уже тогда дал краткое свое видение. Я постараюсь закончить. I my brief I'll stop at that. Путин так себя вел, потому что ему позволяли, когда он шел в банк, все ну, сбрасывали карты и позволяли ему делать то, что он делает. Отходили в сторону. Путин acts the way he acts because he was allowed to act this way um, because everyone else folded their cards and let him be and do what he does. Европа относится достаточно лояльно к его действиям, то есть они не сопротивляются им. 
Единственная страна, которая может сопротивляться и которая заинтересована в сохранении демократии в мире, является Соединенные Штаты. Европа очень лоял к Путину и оффер очень мало резистенции. Единственная страна, которая может резистить и оппозиция Владимир Путин, это Соединенные Штаты Америки. Попытки Украины стать членом Европейского Союза и вступить в НАТО пока не дают результатов. И если они не дадут результатов, то помочь Украине и вообще исправить ситуацию, опять-таки, могут только Соединенные Штаты. От позиции Штатов зависит дальнейший ход событий. Attempts of Ukraine to join European Union and NATO failed. The only country that can help Ukraine to maintain its position right now and um, survive is the United States. Например, сегодня в Черном море э, находится 78 единиц э, флота России, из них 18 боевых эсминцев, э, которые э, имеют на вооружении суперсоник, и нет ни одного корабля стран НАТО. Currently in the Black Sea there are 78 um, ships of Russia, 16 of which have ultrasonic weapons. None of the ships from the United States or European countries are there at the time. Что, как может поступить, как могут поступить Соединенные Штаты сегодня, как они будут поступать? How can the United States act and how they will act? That's the question. Безусловно, санкции, которые вводятся, это важный инструмент. Of course, um, sanctions that were imposed recently are important instrument. However, uh, да, есть только одно замечание: эти санкции должны быть действенные, они должны быть эффективные. They only know those sanctions; they have to be real. They need to be effective. Когда сначала звучала информация о том, что в качестве санкций может быть отключение России от SWIFT, это прозвучало очень сильно, и я знаю, очень испугало Россию. Um, previously, it was mentioned that Russia will be disconnected from SWIFT code, and um, it was very effective and strong promise. Но потом под воздействием финансовых транснациональных корпораций, кругов, этот пункт убрали, потому что здесь появились финансовые интересы транснациональных корпораций и финансистов всего мира, включая финансистов США. Shortly after this sanction was off the table, because um, certain economic interest of uh, international and uh, American companies prevailed, and the sanction is no longer in act. Понятно, что в крупнейшей компании России Газпроме 20% принадлежат British Petroleum, 27% находится компании Соединенных Штатов, и деньги и получение прибыли это важно. Газпром um, is the large, largest gas production company in Russia. Um, British Petroleum is 27%, and so is the United States. And obviously, this um, is really important aspect. Но зарабатываемые деньги сегодня цена их через некоторое время может быть гораздо больше за это придется заплатить, потому что в оценке должны быть сегодня не деньги, а благополучие мира, мир сам, демократия в мире, то есть то, что ждет завтра. There is a very high price to pay for the money we make right now. It should not be the focus. The focus should be prosperity, peace among all the nations. Поэтому санкции они не должны носить формализованный характер, а они должны быть определенным оружием, которое может остановить агрессию. Санкции не должны быть формальными. Они должны быть оружием, которое может остановить агрессию. И следующее. Мое мнение, что вполне возможно, поскольку НАТО не пытается ну, взять Украину, то возможно 
имеет место союз, определенные союзы военно-политические между США и Украиной. In my opinion, if Ukraine cannot join NATO, there should be um, economic and military union between Ukraine and the United States. И в Соединенных Штатах, в отличие от России, где все решает один человек, Соединенные Штаты это страна демократичная. Здесь есть народ, есть его мнение, есть мнение политиков, есть мнение очень многих уважаемых людей, и это мнение, оно должно сформировать свою позицию, позицию США в этом вопросе. Unlike Russia, where one person decides everything, United States is a democratic country. We have politicians, we have civilians, we have wonderful people, wonderful minds, we collectively can make right decisions. Я не пытаюсь навязать какое-то мнение, я всего лишь даю информацию, и хочу привлечь внимание э, слушателей для того, чтобы они сформировали свое отношение и для себя решили, что для них важно. Мир, э, будущее детей, либо экономический интерес. I'm not opposing my opinion, but I'd like to stress the fact that we need to make choice between what's important our economic interest or peace and prosperity of our children. Вкратце я ситуацию рассказал, и если есть вопросы, с удовольствием отвечу на них. I'd like to take questions now, if there's any. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now we are very clear this is not going to stop here. There are designs for um, the West that are very, very dire. Now we are going to ask uh, Ricardo Israel, who has who was graduated as as a lawyer, he, he, who who became a lawyer at the University of Chile in 1972, was um, visiting a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh, was um, assistant professor at the University of Essex in England, and he has worked in the United States as professor, visiting professor Fulbright in Wheaton College in Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. I Mr. Israel is also a member of the Board of Directors of Inter-American Institute for Democracy. Welcome, Ricardo. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Prudavievich. I, I hope I said it right. Uh, because we have heard since this crisis started a lot on the position of Mr. Putin and, the, and Russia, and the position of the government of the United States, but not a lot about what's the position of Ukraine. So in that sense, you are very welcome. I think that Putin has been successful because many times uh, the people who are in the other side have been wrong about his motivation. The question, if this will be uh, the start of an awakening, or he repeat his success of 2014, his success in Crimea, his success in Syria, and in Georgia. Will Ukraine be the victim? Will this will be the end of Donetsk and Lugansk as part of Ukraine and will become part of Russia will be imposed on Ukraine a solution similar as the ones that were found uh, during the Cold War for Finland and Austria in the sense of an imposed neutrality. And I would say that I'm very much pessimist in the sense 
that sooner or later there will be a negotiation with Mr. Putin. Perhaps it will remind me of the second part of the missile crisis of Cuba, that after the return, after uh, the missiles went back to the to the Soviet Union at that time, there was a negotiation for the missiles in Turkey to come back to the United States. What does he want Putin? I think that the mistake is to see it in terms of the Soviet Union all over again. And I think that Ukraine is a means to another end, the great Russia. This has been undertaken since Vladimir Putin became president of Russia. Why would the United States accept at the end of a negotiation? I would say that all what is demanded today of Putin will be part of that negotiation. And I think that there is three reasons why the United States and the West could accept that negotiation. One has been clear until he decided to recognize the popular republics of Donetsk and Lugansk. That is a division in the West, clear in Syria, in Iraq, Afghanistan, but also clear in Europe. There is not the same interest in oil and gas when half your gas depends on Russia. And beside that, I think there are three things. The most important one is China. Russia is not today the main adversary. This great Russia, or the reproduction of what the, the interest the national interest was at the time of the Tsar is for Europe and for Asia, not for the whole of the world. And the, really the great division in 21st century is between China and United States. And I think that still Russia as is the alternative in the arms race, still a major power in terms of arms. I think in the days when there was 50 years since Richard Nixon changed together with Henry Kissinger, the history of the 20s and the 21st century going to the China, I think that, that is also true in the sense that for the United States, it's a national interest to get Russia to be as neutral as it could be under Putin. The second one is jihad as is shown in Chechnya and in Syria, Russia and Putin are willing to confront the jihad, the Islamic jihad, with soldiers and boots on the ground. And the second one is a, is a minor one, uh, the arms. Let us remember that uh, the, uh, that when the United the, the Soviet Union collapsed, there was discussing a new arms race that still has not had a new solution. There is not a new treaty, and the United States is affected in the sense that this was designed for a type of medium-range missiles, not to be in Europe, but are precisely the ones that are needed for the new theater in Asia. Will that it will happen? Will Ukraine pay the price of this negotiation? Not necessarily. I think that every time you start a negotiation, what is asked at the beginning is not what will be arrived at the end. This will be the start. But it's in my back the president of Georgia, the president of Crimea, and also what happens in 2014, a de facto popular republic of Donetsk and Lugansk. Will the sanction be successful? 
We are in uncharted territory because of something different to the, when we speak about this confrontation of United States and China. People have in mind what happened during the Cold War, but it's not exactly the same. The Soviet Union was contained in the expression of Mr. Kennan, and by the way, Mr. Kennan said in 2008 or 2014 that people like Putin are not moved by economic sanctions, but by geopolitical incentives. And Mr. Kennan, in the contention of the, United, of the Soviet Union, never had what is happening today with China, the possibility of confronting the United States at the extreme level economically. And I end with something what is very important. There is a very important concept of the Cold War that perhaps will be part of that negotiation if it happens, and what will decide what happened with Ukraine is the concept of the red lines. It has been lost. Perhaps the last time that was used was used by President Obama in relation to Syria, that the red lines are what is not to be accepted, what not to be crossed, it has completely disappeared. And I think that it's a welcome opportunity for everyone know, knowing what has not to be crossed. And perhaps what has not to be crossed is what Putin has done. This, what has been done, is against not only the means, not only against means, the base of any solution, but also against international law. It was not accepted at the time that Iraq could not change in the name of history the border it has with Kuwait. And for the same token, it cannot be accepted because of any interpretation of history that you can change by force the border recognized by international <coughs> law. Once again, welcome Mr. Prodajovic, and thank you. Thank you so much for those commentaries. Now we are going to introduce Mr. Professor Louis Fleischmann, who is a doctor in sociology of the New York School of Social Research from New York. Uh, he has a, a, he's a master's of, of, the, of the new school, and uh, he's also a bachelor in science, in, in political science and labor studies of the University of Tel Aviv. Luis is also a, a commentator in radio and television, and is a member of the of the board of directors of the Inter-American Institutes for Democracy. Welcome, Luis. Hi. Thank you so much. What an honor to have uh, Mr. Prodajovic here. I hope I pronounce your name well. Um, um, and hear directly from him. First of all, um, I would like to make some comments in reaction to what Mr. Brodajovic said. Um, I really, uh, 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 really appreciate your words. Uh, two things I want to say. I absolutely agree, um, you know, uh, Richard Haas, who is an ex, he's the head, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, there is a book that he wrote called The World in Disarray. And there he says that uh, Russia and China have limited ambitions. That means Russia, want, Russia both Russia and China, want to control, want to control the so-called nearest abroad. That means Russia cares about the Ukraine, China cares about the Southeast, um, yeah, the, uh, the South China Sea and the East China Sea, but they have no ambitions beyond that. Well, the reality is that I totally agree with Mr. Prodajevich and very much against uh, Richard Haas that that's not the case. I don't think they want to destroy the liberal order, but certainly they want to diminish the liberal order. The United Nations, by the way, something that you mentioned, has never been part of a liberal order. The Human Rights Commission is totally taken over by the, the former Soviet Union and by its clients. 
So there is no way we can have a Kantian type of um, international relations system when the, when the, where the law is when when you have the rule of international law. That that was not possible under the liberal order, and certainly is not will not be possible in the future. I also agree uh, with with Mr. Prodajevic that the United States is probably the strongest power capable of resisting this kind of aggression. We have seen the Europeans in the past. We have seen the Europeans surrendering to Arab boycotts. And we have seen the, now the Europeans hesitating, very concerned about that dependency they have on gas and oil, on Russian gas and oil. Nonetheless, I have to say that despite all the errors, uh, the leadership of President Biden was able to bring together the Europeans in a unified way against the Russian aggression. And that includes also other countries. For instance, I'm hearing that the sanctions, even if they are soft for the time being, have been joined by countries such as Australia, Japan, and a few others. So I think the world is now united. And I really hope that sanctions actually serve as a deterrence to the Russians. And hopefully, we will reach an agreement. And I agree with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ricardo Israel, that it's extremely important to somehow find peace with Russia. And not only because China is, an, is, a, is a, much, a more serious adversary, but also because if we actually get along with Russia, we will be able to solve many other problems in the world, including Syria, as an example, that also Ricardo mentioned. The question is, can we really reach an agreement with Russia? And that's a big question. I believe we can, but it depends on how strong we are. That means to what extent we can impose strong sanctions and force Russia to the negotiating, negotiations table, and to what extent the United States develops what is called a much more global foreign policy that right now it doesn't have. So what do I mean by that? First of all, I agree with uh, Mr. Prodajevic that uh, Russia probably, if he takes over the eastern provinces, these two eastern provinces, provinces of the province, provinces, I'm sorry, of the Ukraine, he's going to move forward into other parts of the Ukraine, or maybe he can threaten the Baltics as well. We never know. Uh, or other former satellites of the Soviet Union. The second thing is that it's very important to know what Russia is doing, all right, outside the direct threats, outside these threats to, of war. For instance, what Putin is doing? Putin is supporting every dictatorship in the world at this point. Every dictatorship in the world. And one thing that I found and we know is that every country that moves from the transitions from democracy to dictatorship, including former allies of the West, like Turkey, Hungary, Poland, Venezuela, they also change their foreign policy. And they usually change their foreign policy for the worst, not for the best. So Venezuela, Turkey, Hungary, and Poland, some of them are already outside the realm of influence of the United States and the West. And some others probably in the future will be outside the realm of influence of the West. Russia knows how to take advantage of these dictators. They support dictatorial candidates, right? Tyrants. Uh, and of course, they bring them to their sphere of influence. For instance, the entire political leaders of the right wing, I'm, I'm talking about the extreme right wing in Europe, actually love Putin. And they follow Putin. Somebody like Orban is totally right, Orban from Hungary is totally right now in the pockets of Putin. 
Poland not yet because of their particular history with the Russians. But we never say never. One day they may be in the pockets of the Russians. So we have to be very careful. But there is another thing. There is another thing. The Russians have been involved in Latin America for a long, a long time. Okay? They are involved in Venezuela, providing weapons. They provide weapons to Nicaragua. They provide weapons to Cuba. And these three countries today are a huge threat to regional security. Consequently, they are also a threat to the United States. So, the, um, not only that, we have other countries that have what is called left-wing leaders, for instance, Peru, Chile, and we don't know in what direction they are going to go. Remember that the left in Latin America is very much, tends to be anti-American. And as a result, it will be very easy for them to buy into the Russian influence, all right? Or to be subjected to Russian influence. Just a few days ago, we have seen the president of Argentina, Alberto Fernandez, saying to Putin in China in a meeting in Beijing, I open the doors for you. I can open the doors of my country so that you could have access to Latin America. Lula da Silva may be the next elected president in Brazil, and he for sure is going to go to the Russian side. How do I know that? Because he belonged in the past to BRICS, if you recall, and Brazil was part of BRICS. In fact, the B stands for Brazil. In theory, it was an economic alliance, but in practice, it was a political alliance. So another thing. Russia right now is playing a game that is very dangerous against the West. For instance, what happened this morning? The Iranian president is visiting Russia. I can assure you that Russia is going to use Iran against the United States and its allies in the West. So I believe that already Russia and also China are supporting Iran and they certainly don't mind if they develop a nuclear weapon. So I think it is very important to find some sort of understanding with Russia. I agree with Ricardo that it is possible, but it depends on our strength. Peace has to come through strength. And not to speak about if we fail, if the United States fails to confront Russia properly, we are going to have the Chinese threatening Japan, threatening Taiwan, and maybe South Korea. So I think this is a very serious moment that goes well beyond the Ukraine. And I think it's a huge test for the United States and its allies. Thank you so much. It indeed is a test for the West, for the American leadership, and for, in, and for Europe. But the question is, are they going to face this challenge up to the point where they can prevent war? Or the fear of entering into a larger conflict is going to freeze the West? And that's, I'm going, this, this question I'm going to pose to our distinguished, our, uh, our distinguished uh, um, guest. And the other question that I would like to pose to you is, Today, the Chinese foreign ministry said that for them, it was not acceptable that any country in the world would lose its sovereignty and its territorial integrity by force. Does this mean that uh, China could be the buffer in this crisis? Uh, what, how do you, do you really think that uh, China is going to adhere itself completely to Russia? Or is there any hope that the Chinese interests collide with the Russian interests and therefore China plays a buffering role? I 
опять-таки вернусь к своим статьям 2014 -го года, когда я описывал эту ситуацию, я обратил внимание на Китай и на его позицию. Let's go back again to my articles from 2014 when I started to pay attention to China and its position. В результате Первой мировой войны и Второй мировой войны некоторые страны, в том числе, например, Соединенные Штаты, получили определенные преференции. After World War One and World War Two, certain countries, including United States, um, received certain benefits. И Китай демонстрирует свою позицию и политику в последнее время следующим образом. Он это чисто китайская психология. Он сидит на горе и ждет, когда будут драться два тигра. So recently China demonstrated typical Chinese psychology, sitting high on the mountain, looking down and see how two tigers are fighting. Он ждет ослабления России, потому что вот э, от Урала, от Урала, он уже, у него проживает на территории России более 6 миллионов человек, официально. He's looking what's going to be happening to Russia, how um, it's going to weaken. On the territory of Russia, 6 million Chinese are currently residing. Практически все газодобывающие uh, компании uh, Сибири, uh, основная часть этих компаний, акции принадлежит Китаю. Most of the gas production company in Siberia are served by Chinese. Он ждет, когда большой русский медведь упадет. So he's waiting until big Russian bear will fall. По поводу США, Китай не может сегодня соперничать, но он надеется на этот конфликт, и в этом конфликте он попытается извлечь максимальную пользу. Currently, China cannot really compete with the United States, but he's waiting for its, con for its conflict and to get maximum benefits for himself out of it. Потому что человеческий фактор, фактор промышленности, военный у Китая очень сильный, но история их существования она гласит, что это очень очень хитрые люди с хорошей военной стратегией. There is um, very large human, technological, and industrial factors involved in China. But knowing this particular nation, we should never forget how clever and smart they are to use the situation to their advantage. Если они выступят, если их попросить по просто стороны выступить э, буферной зоной, э, цена за это э, должна быть заплачена очень большая в пользу Китая. If you're gonna ask China to become a mediator, a buffer between Russia and the United States, the price is gonna be very high to be paid. Сегодня позиция Китая исходит из следующего. Китаю не нужны войны, потому что в первую очередь они знают, что не должна пострадать их торговля. Today's position of China is the following. They do not need a war. Why? Primarily because of the economic factor and their economic development, it will affect them negatively. When Putin just flew to China for the Olympics, they didn't officially meet him. They were sitting with some presidents from Turkmenistan. So, China demonstratively didn't give any privilege to Putin. They are waiting for the end of the relations between China and the USA. When Putin arrived. To Olympic Games, he was not greeted personally, and he sat with other presidents, uh, such as President of um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Um, that shows that Chinese are waiting for the right time and see um, how the situation is going to be turning. Дальносрочной перспективы я считаю, что для Соединенных Штатов Китай представляет большую угрозу, чем Россия. In the long term. Chinese pose way bigger danger to the United States than Russia. Uh, Especially dangerous the union of Russia and China. 
Поэтому правильно э, было сказано до меня выступающими, что сегодня нужно продемонстрировать свою силу. Э, это должно быть со стороны США сделано. I agree with other speakers that today we need to demonstrate our power, and our power demonstrated should be really strong on behalf of the United States. К сожалению, история последних десятилетий показывает, что в мире стали превалировать сильные лидеры, и, к сожалению, когда все зависит не от мнения государств и народа, а от мнения лидеров, такие конфликты возникают все чаще и их все тяжелее сдерживать. Unfortunately, history of past decades shows that world order depends on the opinion of leaders. And when the world order depends on the opinion of leaders, there are a lot of mistakes happening and the margin for error is large. Но система демократии для того и существует, чтобы механизмы демократического решения таких конфликтов существовало, а не полагались только на решение отдельных лидеров, диктаторов. That's why we have democratic government, where we can decide on a problem together without relying on the decision of one person, a dictator. И еще я бы хотел сказать вот по поводу э, замечания там по Луганску, по Донецку, буквально там несколько слов. I'd like to say a few words um, in response to comments about uh, Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Э, сепаратисты э, существуют в пределах э, своих э, территорий, которые занимают э, не более одной трети Луганской и Донецкой области. So-called separatists exist in the territory that occupied actually a third of uh, Lugansk and Donetsk, not the entire territory. Вчера Путин объявил, что он считает, что эти две республики должны занимать две области, что ну, гораздо больше, и на тех территориях, где нет сепаратистов, там находятся украинские военные, там находятся люди, которые не хотят быть в этих республиках. In yesterday's announcement, Vladimir Putin counted Donetsk and Lugansk as one whole. That would include not only regions where separatists are staying, but also regions where Ukrainian military is staying currently and Ukrainian citizens are living. Уже несколько дней обстреливают город Мариуполь. Он находится в Донецкой области, но находится на территории Украины. In the past few days, the city of Mariupol was under fire, and um, the city is on territory of Ukraine, which is also part of Donetsk oblast. И, соответственно, словами Путина, российская армия начнет освобождать территории, так называемо, освобождать. То есть захватывать территории этих двух областей, там, где сегодня находятся военные вооруженные силы и граждане, которые э, считают себя гражданами Украины. According to Putin, he will move forward beyond area where separatists are staying and will go into open conflict with uh, Ukrainian military and civilians. Это называется война. It's called war. Она не, не стоит вопрос, начнется ли она, она началась, она уже идет. There's not question if it's gonna start, it's already started. И поэтому э, реакция стран, она должна выйти из зоны предположений, а выйти в область действий. So, instead of guessing, we need to move in the stage of acting. И правильно было сказано, это рубеж, это рубикон, э, после которого наступят последствия. And I agree with the previous speakers. Yes, there is a Rubicon, there is a line that's crossed and um, the circumstances and consequences are great. История, э, наша история общая, она гласит о, о том, что история ничему не учит. Our history teaches us that we learn nothing from it. Но я думаю, наступает то время, когда история должна учить когда нужно делать выводы из предыдущего и в дальнейшем действовать уже с учетом исторических и ошибок и событий. But I think we're entering time where we need to learn from our past mistakes, we need to learn from history and calculate our steps really carefully based on it. 
1664 году Российская империя подвела 100 тысячное войско на Украину для того, чтобы Украина приняла определенные политические шаги. In the year 1664, um, a large Russian army moved into Ukraine and really um, forced the country to accept certain conditions. В результате Украина потеряла армию, флот и право общения с зарубежными странами. So Ukraine lost army, fleet and right to communicate with nearby countries. Эта история, она была, и сегодня она просто повторяется. Это повторяются одни и те же события, они выпадают на долю людей. И главное, что каждый следующий раз принимали правильные решения. It's a history, it's happening again, uh, it's happening to real people, it's really important to make right decisions now. Главное не события, а реальственные события. Поэтому я призываю uh, всех отнестись к этому серьезно. Это, еще раз, это не конфликт Украины с Россией. Our reactions to these events are crucial and we're um, asking all the people to pay attention. Спасибо. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our speaker, Dr. Valentin Prodajevic. Thank you for our commentators. And please follow us to, uh, through the streaming presentations. Our next forum is Wednesday next week. Thank you for watching us and for following the, uh, and supporting the Inter-American Institute for Democracy.